All right, guys, banner day here in D.C. with the return of former President Obama to the White House um, for a hangout with his buddy, Joe Biden. Um, Biden is, let's go ahead and put USA Today up on the screen here. So Biden is expected to sign uh, an executive order with regards to sort of shoring up the Affordable Care Act. And I believe they're supposed to speak together at like 2 p.m. And from the Rose Garden. This is the first time that Obama has returned to the White House since he was in office. Um, we all know he's kind of, he really picks and chooses when he engages in any sort of political fights. Famously, when he was even president, he liked to kind of remain above the fray and like to get his hands dirty yes. with, the, with the common folk in terms of actually engaging in the give and take of politics. He had a little bit of disdain for that. We also know very famously on the campaign trail, first of all, he did not endorse Biden until the deal was done. Yep. Biden was like, oh, I asked him not to endorse. Okay, sure. Uh, yeah, sure. Okay, sure. Um, it also was reported that during that uh, campaign, as he was watching things unfold, he was telling his advisors privately, like, don't underestimate the ability yes. of Joe Biden to F things up, That's which right. I think was a very accurate assessment of not only the Biden campaign, but also how the Biden White House has unfolded. Um, it is very telling that the thing he returns for is his primary legacy, the Affordable Care Act, because that's what this guy is mostly about at this point. It's about preserving his brand. It's about mm -hmm. preserving his legacy. And that may sound like, okay, well, you know, that's understandable, no big deal. But that means making sure that no one goes beyond what he did. Because, you know, if you had, for example, universal health care, well, then that really reveals and shows up how inadequate the Affordable Care Act ultimately was and how it was largely, while it did contain some significant real improvements in terms of pre-existing conditions and some of those other things, but ultimately also was a giant giveaway to the health insurance industry. Jen Psaki was asked about all of this yesterday and... She has a way of like saying things that she doesn't mean to be revealing, but actually are Very. really revealing because she's just so in the DC bubble. She doesn't really understand how her words are going to land. Yeah. Let's take a listen to a little bit of what she had to say. So tomorrow they'll announce more steps. I'll also note, uh, as they did uh, every week when uh, President, former President Obama was president and President Biden was vice president, that's a mouthful, um, they will have lunch tomorrow as well as they used to do on a weekly basis. I would note they continue to talk regularly. They are real friends, not just Washington friends. And so I'm sure they will talk about events in the world as well as their families and personal lives. See, real that, friends, yeah, not, not just actual not just Washington, Washington friends. friends. And for the uninitiated, this is the part that's so revealing. Mm -hmm. Like the term Washington friends is so gross because what they're talking about is something that is just purely transactional it's and so cynical awful, guys. and would yeah. be a completely foreign concept to, you know, 99% of the country, yeah. but it's just, you know, part of doing business here in Washington is, of course, you have some, a few real friends, and he, she puts Barack and, and Joe into that category, and then you have, like, the fake friends that you're just basically using for your own ends. Having come from that world, that's the worst part of it, how transactional everything is, being required to go to parties with a bunch of people that you don't like, and they don't like you, and, they and you're only there in <laughs> order to, to like network so that you can all get more information <laughs> so you can continue to do your job better. This yeah. was a key part of being a White House correspondent. And it is such a revealing comment. And you see it all the time when you're here. People are dining next to each other and they're like doing the cheers and, you know, the this. And it's like, you hate each other's guts. Everybody knows that. But it's all complete kabuki theater. It reminds me of my, one of my favorite moments of the campaign. Let's put this up there this on the screen. Hilarious. This is a real trip down memory lane for us. Uh, Joe Biden tweeting in 2019, happy best friends day to my friend at Barack Obama <laughs> with the Joe and Barack friendship bracelet. <laughs> that tweet was so cringe that David Axelrod, who worked for Barack Obama and the chief strategist on the Obama campaign, replied, quote, this is a joke, right? <laughs> and it's because at that time, Biden was 2% or whatever in the polls, complete failure, and he was trying as hard as he could to ride Obama's coattails to try and win the Iowa caucuses and to gain more foothold with the Democratic primary base. It really is stunning to just think back to what it was, to how Biden was such a failure pre-coronavirus, so many gaffes on the campaign trail, making a fool out of himself, with full knowledge by the Obamas and many people around him that Biden is an awful candidate. Uh, put that up there on the screen. You're a 
alluding, you were alluding to this quote, and this is a direct one, which is that Obama reportedly said, quote, don't underestimate Joe's ability to F things up. I mean, I agree, Mr. President. Fair. If it's you look a back very accurate to, assessment. you know, Obamacare is a great example. What did Biden do on that hot mic the day that it passed? You know, he co- leans into Obama in the when the mic is hot, he goes, this is a big effing deal, which became a meme. I mean, the guy, what, you know, before he was verbally incontinent, he was a, known as the gaff machine. Mm-hmm. That was his nickname in DC within the press. Everybody's like, oh, he always says something which causes a problem. It was an open secret in Washington that the Obama people and Obama specifically could not stand whenever Biden went off script and whenever we do these things because it would cause big headaches for him and his team. So a lot of this is just contrived. Oh, they're real friends, not just Washington friends. That's not true. Otherwise, Obama would have endorsed you. Or as Biden said, uh, I asked him not to endorse. He, he, he said it so seriously. I asked him not to endorse. I asked him not to endorse. No, you no, didn't. Serious. Or Literally maybe no you did that. after you found out he wouldn't endorse you. He was not going to endorse you. Yeah. It's um, such a joke. Yeah. So I, there's a couple other things to say about it. First of all, I saw some more David Axelrod analysis. Oh, of yeah. What did he Obama say? coming back to the White House, and he's like, oh, it's a smart move because, uh, of course, you know, Obama has this great relationship with the base of the Democratic Party, which is true. He does have, he is held in high regard mm-hmm. with the base of the Democratic Party. But it also has been proven, like, for over a decade now that he is unable to translate his own personal popularity into votes. 100%. I mean, that was true when he was in office. Democrats got destroyed across the country while Barack Obama was in office, losing a record number of state houses and a thousand state legislative seats in the House and the Senate and ultimately the presidency to Donald Trump. He was not able to confer his personal popularity into political power for literally anyone, not Hillary Clinton. You know, he refrained from getting involved in the Biden thing. The only thing he's really been effective at is these kind of like backroom deals and machinations behind the scene, for example, putting Tom Perez in, installing him as the head of the DNC, and also being involved in, you know, when everybody dropped down and made it a one-on-one contest between Biden and Bernie to make sure that Biden ends up, after all other options are exhausted, make sure Biden actually ends up as the nominee in order to crush Bernie Sanders. I mean, if you think about that record, really the only ways he's been politically effective is to use his influence within the party machinery in order to crush the influence of the left and deny what is like the sort of most, the most compelling and interesting and uh, compelling, especially among younger generations, part of the Democratic Party. So that has been his real influence. And so if they think that he's going to save them in the midterms, like that is really fanciful. But I think it also is a sign of desperation that they're saying, all right, let's bring yeah. let's bring Obama back. Like Biden's clearly not getting the job done here. 100 percent. That, that's how I read it. That's there's true. there's one other thing to say about this, which is that Um, And the American Prospect has done the reporting on this. Democrats have, uh, they do have a big problem in terms of the Affordable Care Act. Just as they allowed the child tax credit to expire, and I show the polling here a couple times of how that directly led to more independents fleeing the Democratic Party when they Mm -hmm. lost that benefit, which really propped up and and supported a lot of families and kept a lot of children, millions of children, out of poverty and out of hunger. So they dropped the ball on that one. That was supposed to be extended as part of Build Back Better bill. But they also dropped the ball on these Affordable Care Act subsidies Mm. that were passed at the same time, which benefit some 14 million people. And guess what? They're going to get 14 million Americans, thereabouts, are going to get a letter in October informing them that their health insurance premiums are about to skyrocket. Wow. All because Democrats could not get it together to make these subsidies permanent. They were afraid to put it in the original, when they originally passed the bill, because they were worried about the cost. And so, and they thought, oh, surely, surely we'll be able to, you know, extend this thing because no one will want to see their premiums go up. Well, they've completely failed. And so they've set up for themselves this October surprise, surprise 14 million Americans. And by the way, because of the crazy, confusing, means-tested structure of the Affordable Care Act, the people who are going to see their um, prices skyrocket the most 
happen to be older middle-class Americans. Guess who always votes in midterm elections? Older middle class <laughs> Americans. So if you wanted to screw over a more potent political base, like congratulations, you really hit the nail on the head here. So while this executive order that Biden is planning to sign, it has to deal with another little loophole in the Affordable Care Act that he apparently mm -hmm. has the power to close. This is the real problem here and why they're still desperately trying to figure out something with Joe Manchin, because otherwise a lot of voters, millions of them are going to get a rude awakening right as they're getting ready to go to the polls. Yeah, it's not like inflation was killing you enough already. And right. just reading the way that this executive order is constructed just shows you why Obamacare is like literally the worst of all worlds. The administration <laughs> is closing what's, no closing what's known as the family glitch, stems from a part of the healthcare law that deals with eligibility and premium subsidies and ultimately prices some families out of health insurance. Under current regs, people who are eligible for affordable employer health insurance aren't eligible for premium assistance on the ACA marketplace. The Obama administration did not defined affordability as the premium for a single beneficiary being below a certain percentage of family income, which doesn't take into account the higher cost of adding dependents to family coverage. I have no idea what you I said. don't even know what I just said. <laughs> All I know is I had to purchase health insurance on the marketplace, and it cost a ton of money yeah. for a terrible plan. Yeah. Shocker. You don't have kids. Yeah, I'm, no I don't idea. even have, I'm a single <laughs> male below 30, or not, below 30 for the next two weeks, and uh, during that, I have no underlying health care conditions, paying hundreds of dollars a month for disaster. Essentially, I, I, if I get hit by a bus, it'll be worth it. Catastrophic. I, yeah, catastrophic. Coverage. Yeah. I, I better, if I get bone marrow cancer, well, then we'll be okay. And That's about it. There's so much to say about yeah. the Affordable Care Act because part, okay, so the, the big reason why it's structured in such a shitty way is because they decided we're not going to stand up to the health insurance industry. Yeah. We're just going to make it a giveaway for them so that they don't destroy this thing. So that's the biggest problem. But the second biggest problem is that they were so worried about like these talking points around, oh, it's too expensive and deficit reduction or whatever, that they contorted it in all of these crazy ways that they knew at the time were going to be a problem. But they again figured like, We'll fix it down the road. Yeah. It's gonna people are gonna like it. It's gonna be popular. We'll, just, we'll be able to fix this down the road, and I think Republicans will go along with it at that point, or we'll have power, or whatever. We'll fix it. And so things like this are a known issue. The whole reason the subsidies weren't sufficient in the first place was because they were worried about like, oh, you're spending too right. much money. And so because they hamstring themselves from the jump, that means oh, lo and behold, the policy is not that popular. And oh, lo and behold, when it comes to trying to shore it up and trying to fix it, Americans don't actually have any confidence that you are doing a good job on health care to start with. So they are not highly motivated to give you the political power to be able to make these fixes. What they've learned from all of this with you know, health care situation and Obamacare situation, what the D.C. Democrats have learned is, oh, people don't reward you for like doing good work mm. and passing good policy. Yeah. No, people don't reward you for passing like convoluted, half-assed policies that were a mixed bag for a whole lot of people. That's what they don't reward you for. And so, you know, that has led to a shift towards, that's helped contribute to the shift among Democrats towards cultural signals signaling and, and culture war and virtue signaling when the exact opposite lesson should be learned, which is like, no, actually, we should have stood up. We shouldn't have been afraid of those talking points to start with. We should have actually passed the legislation that would deliver for the American people and then have faith that they're going to see, you know, oh, this actually benefits my bottom line here. And oh, by the way, the most important thing to say about this is maybe you should also just do that because it's the right thing to do and not out of some like weird political calculus about how it's going to play in the midterms or the next presidential yeah, look, election. Just make healthcare cheaper. Everyone will be happy. That's all anybody wants. And yet they twist themselves into all of these things. And that's how you end up in the nightmare situation, which all of us are in right now. I can get them right among with you people. Yeah. <laughs> Cable news is ripping us apart, dividing the country, making it impossible to function as a society, and making it impossible to know just what is true and what is false. But the good news is they are failing and they know it. That is why we're building something new, a new mainstream, a healthier one, something more trustworthy, something that we are going to need in one of the most pivotal times in American history. We are building up here for the midterms, for the upcoming presidential election, but we need your help. So if you can help us out by becoming a premium member today at breakingpoints.com, we're trying to change America for the better and the entire world. So what are you waiting for, guys? Go to breakingpoints.com and sign up and help us build a new mainstream.